So we're coming towards the end of the year, the end of 2020. Thank the Lord we are coming to the end of 2020. What a garbage fire of a year it's been. But when it comes to Impact Wrestling, you think about all the signings that they have done this year, whether it's Brian Myers, Eric Young, EC3, you could go on and on and on and on and on uh, when it comes to the signings, the Good Brothers as well, of course. You always have to look forward to the future, though. And obviously, at the moment, there are quite a few free agents out there, whether it's from WWE, NWA, or a variety of independent wrestling promotions. So the question naturally then becomes, who could Impact Wrestling potentially sign in the year 2021? We know that lots of Impact Wrestling stars, contracts are expiring at the end of this year. Ethan Page, Tyre Valkyrie, and a whole bunch of others as we get into the early part of 2021, whether it's Moose, Rosemary, Willie Mac, and others. So you always have to have a lookout as to who you can bring in while some are going out. So who could Impact Wrestling potentially look to sign in 2021? Well, I've had a few thoughts and I've had a look and this is going to be essentially a video where we talk about some names potentially that we could see come into Impact Wrestling in 2021. So let's get straight into it because there's quite a few names on this list. Starting off with Bully Ray. Now Bully Ray, of course, former uh, TNA World Heavyweight Champion, former leader of the Aces and Eights. Bully Ray at this point, I mean the history that he has with Impact Wrestling, I think uh, on this list there's only maybe one person that's maybe got more history with the company than him. We'll touch on them later on. When it comes to Bully Ray, of course, he's currently out of contract. He was previously with Ring of Honor, but he was uh, his contract expired over the summer. He wasn't released. His contract expired over the summer with Ring of Honor. He was actually helping book out the Woman of Honor division there, uh, but then he once uh, he came out of that position, his contract then expired. And at the time, I say at the time. Ring of Honor wasn't handing out new contracts or extensions to contracts because of the pandemic and the uncertainty that came with the pandemic. So at the time, they were not handing out contracts. So as far as we're aware at the moment, Bully Ray is still a free agent. He's still not under contract to any promotion. Therefore, if you impact wrestling, having someone on the free agent list like Bully Ray, to me, it seems it seems a certainty or it should like it should be a, a decision that Impact looks at. And it's, it's, it's a non-decision, quite frankly. Bully Ray, you look at the history he has with the company. Yes, he's older and people will say, well, can he still go in the ring? I think at this point, it doesn't matter as much with someone like Bully Ray. The matches have always been a bit secondary with Bully Ray. Bully Ray has had great matches, don't get me wrong. When he was part of the Dudley Boys, Team 3D, even as the Bully Ray character in Impact Wrestling, I think of the last man standing match he had with AJ Styles at Slammiversary, I think in 2011, I think that was, or 2010, around that period of time. Uh, obviously, the run with the TNA World Heavyweight Championship, the matches against Sting, Jeff Hardy, etc., and the leader of the Aces and Eights. If you watch this channel, you know that I'm a fan of the Aces and Eights. I enjoyed the gimmick. I know people didn't. There was teases and rumors over the summer that they were going to return, but it was just a red herring. Nevertheless, Bully Ray, even in the year 2021, still has a position, in my opinion, to go in Impact Wrestling and compete. I think he would still offer so much, just as much as the experience, I think. But like I said, the matches are almost secondary when it comes to Bully Ray. His real ability and his real standout purpose, I think, in Impact Wrestling in 2021 would be to add a little bit of star power, a little bit of experience, but his ability on the mic. Yes, Bully Ray's older at this point. Yes, he, his ability in the ring probably has diminished from what it once was. He's not in his prime anymore or anything like that, but it doesn't really matter. Having Bully Ray on the show, having his presence, his mic ability, his experience and history with the company, it all just seems like a... It's an, again, it's a non-decision. It's a non-decision as to why Bully Ray, I think, should return to Impact Wrestling. Now, will it happen? You have to look at when we talk about these names on this list. Is it uh, the likeliness or you know, the likelihood that it would happen and Bully Ray could return to Impact Wrestling? I saw an interview with Eric Bischoff recently where he said, I can't remember who it was with. It might have been with Digital Spy. And he said that he finds it baffling almost that nobody has reached out to Bully Ray and said, do you want to sign with the company? I think Bully Ray at this point in his career, is he going to go to AEW? You know, I just don't think so at this point. I think AEW, look, they've got a huge roster as it is. Quite a young roster too. Obviously, they're bringing in some legends. I think if they were to bring in a Bully Ray, it would probably be behind the scenes. When it comes to Impact Wrestling, there is still so much Bully Ray can offer in front of the camera and behind the camera too. And you have to look at the relationships that are already in the company for him there. You've got Tommy Dreamer, who is a prominent backstage producer for Impact Wrestling, of course, a talent on the screen as well. Bully Ray with the history with Dreamer, with the company, it just seems like a slam dunk to me. So hopefully we'll see Bully Ray with one more run in Impact Wrestling in 2021. Doesn't look like he's retired or anything like that yet. Of course, he still hopes to bust his open radio show on Sirius XM. 
But as far as I'm aware, he's not decided that he's going to hang it up and he still feels like he's got something to give. And I think that something that he should give should be an Impact Wrestling. So fingers crossed we see Bully Ray return to Impact in 2021. Now, another name is Aiden English. We spoke about Aiden English before here on the channel. We spoke about what Aiden English could offer to Impact Wrestling. And Aiden English, I think, is so useful when it comes to someone like Impact Wrestling because he quite literally can do it all. Aiden English, of course, he has capabilities as a pro wrestler. We've seen that during his time of WWE. He had the run as the NXT Tag Team Champion during his time with the Black and Gold brand. Obviously, he also was part of a tag team with Simon Gotch and the Board Villains. Obviously, they split up and he became a singles competitor. But also, we saw Aiden English transition into a broadcasting role as well because obviously, he was the commentator for 205 Live during the end of his WWE career. Now, what has he been doing post-WWE? Because, of course, Aiden English was released earlier this year as part of the budget cuts associated uh, with the current pandemic. Well, obviously, he sat out his non-compete clause. I think he's done a couple of independent shots in Chicago, which is where he's from. Uh, and he's been doing a bit of commentary, a bit of wrestling, and that's about it. When especially you have Madison Rain leaving the company soon and you've got this vacant position in the broadcast booth to join Josh Matthews. I know I did a video the other day talking about potential replacements. I still do think it will probably be Matt Stryker as the person to replace Madison Rain in Impact Wrestling going forward in that broadcasting role on Access TV. But if you get someone like Aiden English in, you've got someone who is maybe newer, fresher, does have experience in the broadcast booth, working for 205 Live, can transition into becoming a wrestler anytime. But if it is going to be Matt Stryker that goes into the broadcast booth, you still want to bring in someone like Aiden English because he can be a manager, he can be a mouthpiece, he can be a wrestler. There is so much that Aiden English has to offer, I think. So again, a bit like with the Bully Ray one, why wouldn't you make an offer? This guy is interested, he's hungry to prove his worth. He's hungry to prove that WWE was wrong to release him. Like I say about all the, the guys and girls that Impact Wrestling signed earlier this year, whether it is Deanna Perrazzo, uh, Eric Young, EC3, the Good Brothers, etc. Having that chip on their shoulder when they come in is so important because you need to have that belief in yourself. You need to have that desire to prove people wrong, to prove that WWE, quite frankly, were wrong to let them go in the first place. Aiden English has that. And as I mentioned, he is a multi-tooled player. He really is because he can offer so much. He's not just a wrestler. He can be a broadcaster. He can be a manager. He can be a mouthpiece. He can do everything. So Aiden English is one to look out for. Let's switch to a knockout and possibly a return to the company, that being Zelina Vega. Now, Zelina Vega's release from WWE actually shocked everyone. Obviously, that was a couple of months ago. It had to do with the third-party edict when it comes to Twitch, Cameo, OnlyFans, etc., I still think it's a bad call by WWE. I think, you know, if you've watched the channel before, you'll know. I think the whole third party edict by Vincent Mann is BS. I think it's just motivated by greed and money. All they want at this point, WWE, is to take money out of the pockets of their performers during a period of time where they're not running live events, so their monetary gain is lesser and lesser than any other year and they're trying to take money out of the pocket of the talents when they're trying to make ends meet on these uh, these third party platforms. In the case of Zelina Vega, she was making more money than her WWE contract on Twitch and on Cameo uh, and on OnlyFans and anything like that. So they decided that they were going to get rid of her for that reason. They were trying to send a message to the talent. We're not afraid to fire someone. We're not afraid to fire someone with promise or anything like that. I think it's disgusting, quite frankly. I think it's disgusting. I think the reports that Vince McMahon didn't even talk to Zelina Vega when she left and she was escorted from the arena. I understand that's what happens when people get fired. But the fact that Vince McMahon couldn't be bothered or couldn't find the time to talk to Zelina Vega when she did get fired the day she got fired, I think it's ridiculous. I think it's ridiculous. So... Her uh, non-compete clause expires in February, so we're not going to see Zelina Vega at Hard to Kill. But the interesting thing when it comes to Impact Wrestling, of course, is that she does have history with the company. It's where she really made her start in pro wrestling, was with Impact Wrestling, with uh, Mexican America. Obviously, she uh, competed in a tag team there with Sarita during her time there. She was known as Rosita at the time. And obviously, I mentioned Tommy Dreamer as well. Tommy Dreamer is a prominent person in Impact Wrestling now as a backstage producer and also a talent on screen. But also, he was one of the people that actually truly did help train and bring Zelina Vega into pro wrestling. When she spoke about her release by WWE, she thanked numerous names, including the likes of The Rock. But she also singled out Tommy Dreamer as someone who believed in her, inspired her and helped her get her break and chance in pro wrestling. And that was in Impact Wrestling in the first place. 
So obviously there's ties back to the company because of her history of Impact Wrestling. There's ties with Tommy Dreamer. And look, I don't think Zelina Vega's finished with pro wrestling. I've seen some people say, oh, maybe she'll just decide to do the Twitch stuff. She'll continue to do the Twitch stuff and she'll continue to do very, very well and make more money than she was on her WWE contract. The difference is now, if she signs with Impact or she signs with AEW or wherever, she can do the Twitch stuff, she can do the third party stuff, but she can also wrestle as well and she can also make money from wrestling. So I mentioned it at the time. If anything, she's better off for leaving WWE. And I know she's been quite vocal about supporting unionization in pro wrestling, whether or not that actually happens. Like, who knows? You know, 2020 has been a crazy year. 2021 might be even crazier. Who knows? So at this point, I can't rule out anything in pro wrestling. I just can't see it uh, when it comes to unionizing pro wrestling because I think people in power, people high up, the pro wrestlers in the industry that really need to support it to make it happen, I think have a lot to lose. And I think they might be not intimidated, but they might look at the writing on the wall there and say, look, if I don't support it and I get make out a deal with the WWE or whoever to make a good amount of money, then that benefits me and my family. It, it goes back to the same when it happened in the 1980s with Hulk Hogan and Jesse Ventura. Jesse Ventura needed Hulk Hogan to make that deal work. Hulk Hogan wasn't behind it. He stooged off to Vince McMahon. And we're here in 2020. We still don't have a union in pro wrestling. It's exactly the same, I think, in the sense that there are people, prominent people in the pro wrestling industry that won't support it. Hence, I can't see it. Now, I've seen some people say, well, because Selena Vega supported unionization in pro wrestling, she's never going to get a job. I don't believe that or subscribe to that for a single second. She's Alina Vega. She is a well-known star. She's decent in the ring. Obviously, we know her ability on the mic. She managed her management of Andrade. Her pairing with Andrade really helped elevate Andrade and helped turn his career around in NXT from not really doing anything to becoming NXT champion and then them being called to the main roster. Earlier this year, Zelina Vega was a mouthpiece, a manager for three stars on Monday Night Raw and Andrade, Angel Garza, and Austin Theory. So... This is someone with a ton of talent, uh, still I think hasn't reached her prime or her peak when it comes to pro wrestling yet, so a ton of potential too. So if you're Impact Wrestling, I would be stunned if they don't make her an offer. The issue I suppose is, is you're going to have companies like AEW are going to be interested because she's that big a talent. It then becomes a case of, can Impact Wrestling win that bidding war when it comes to AEW? That will have to remain to be seen, but I've said this numerous times, don't rule out the money that Impact has. If they make her a good, they can make a good financial offer, and then you've got the pull of returning to Impact plus returning to work with Tommy Dreamer. That is something to to consider. But again, AEW, unfortunately, they have more money than Impact Wrestling, and they do have the pull of being on TNT and having a stacked roster and a lot of a lot of great talent to work with there. But if you're a female and you look at the female side of things, if you're a female wrestler, I've said this before. Why would you want to go to AEW? because you're going to get a five-minute match on Dynamite every week. If you go to Impact Wrestling, you're going to get TV main events, possibly pay-per-view main events, and TV special main events. Just ask Deanna Perrazzo and Jordan Grace this year. So if you're a female wrestler, you go to Impact Wrestling over AEW any day of the week. That's just my opinion, but the evidence speaks there for itself. So Zelina Vega is another one. Speaking of people that were released back in April, Curtis Axel. Now, I've done a video as well about Curtis Axel here on the channel. What's interesting about Curtis Axel is he's remained largely silent since his release by WWE back in April. Now, it's actually what was interesting about that is Heath, of course, currently signed to Impact Wrestling. He was one of the names from WWE that was released that eventually did sign with Impact. He made his debut at Slammiversary earlier this year. He did actually speak about Curtis Axel briefly in an interview that he did earlier this year. And he basically said, look... After being with WWE for a long, long time, like Curtis Axel, at the moment he's just taken it easy, riding out this pandemic with his family, staying at home with his kids and looking after them, uh, and spending some time with his family. I think as a guy that's been with WWE when he was released for, what, 10 years, maybe even longer in developmental, he's probably earned the time off. And he said at the moment he doesn't know, Heath said at the moment he doesn't know if Curtis Axel has a desire to return to pro wrestling. But what's important there is that Heath openly spoke about Curtis Axel being a longtime friend of his. And he actually said that he's asked Curtis Axel several times, you know, you really want to come to Impact. It's different here. It's got a different vibe. You can prove people wrong. You can still find your love once again for pro wrestling. And we can do something really special here. So again, you have to look at the likelihood of it happening. I think a lot of these times when it comes to these free agents, you look at the two major options uh, Impact Wrestling and AEW. Yes, you have Ring of Honor and MLW. There are obviously factors in it as well. I think someone like Curtis Axel 
if he goes to AEW, I just don't see that happening. Again, not to diss Curtis Axel or not to put any disrespect towards him or anything like that. I just don't know, quite frankly, if AEW would be that interested. Not because he's not a big enough star, but again, you look at their roster. AEW's roster is very, very bloated. They're very, very bloated roster. If anything, it's probably too big. Tony Khan has spoken about that several times, that it probably is too big. They certainly do have an issue with signing talent and then signing more and more and more talent. And then they've only got two hours on TNT every single week. And look, they, a lot of people don't get the time they probably should on that program because the roster is so big. Curtis Axel, if he signs for AEW, I think he gets lost in the shuffle. I could see him signing with an MLW or a Ring of Honor. I think when it comes to Impact, though, as I mentioned, he's got the relationships with the likes of Heath. So if you've got someone like Heath reaching out and making offers and saying, look, you should come over to Impact. It's different. It's fun. It's You can have a lot of fun here. You can work with me. You can work with Rhino, all that kind of stuff. I think potentially that is something to consider there. So when it comes to, like I mentioned before, the likelihood of it happening, I think Impact Wrestling would be in pole position to sign a Curtis Axel in 2021. Whether or not it happens, we'll have to wait and see. Now let's go back to a knockout and maybe a returning knockout to Impact Wrestling, that being Alison Kay. Now Alison Kay, of course, former NWA World Women's Champion. She was previously, most recently with the NWA, but her contract expired back in November. Of course, she was a prominent figure on the NWA Power Series last year and early this year prior to the pandemic. She had great matches with the likes of Thunder Rosa and others. And she also has a history with Impact Wrestling too. Now, most recently, we saw her compete on an AEW show. We saw her compete at Full Gear on a pre-show against Serena Deeb for the NWA World Women's Championships. As far as I'm aware, she has not signed a contract with AEW as of yet, and she hasn't re-signed with the NWA or anything like that. So she is a free agent. Plus, of course, she has history with Impact Wrestling. She has history with Impact Wrestling. She's a former Knockouts champion during her time there, known as Sienna. That was in around... 2017, I believe that period of time, the whole GFW time was around that period. So Alison Kay has a lot of history when it comes to Impact Wrestling. And once again, I've spoken about this before. I spoke about it just a minute ago when I was speaking about Zelina Vega. If you're a female and you're a free agent and you weigh up your options, where are you going to go? AEW, I understand she did do an appearance for AEW. I thought the match she had with uh, Serena Deeb on the Full Gear pre-show was very, very good. But again, it was a pre-show. I didn't understand at the time, and I still don't understand why that couldn't have been on the main card. Why couldn't you move another match to the pre-show? Why couldn't you have two female matches on a pay-per-view? Oh, heaven forbid, right? Oh, because AEW couldn't do that. The booking philosophy when it comes to AEW and the women's division is just bizarre. I, I just... Uh, I, I did a whole video yesterday sort of ranting about it for 10, 15 minutes, so be sure to check that out if you <laughs> if you want to hear my real thoughts about the AEW booking philosophy when it comes to female wrestling. I think Alison Kay, look, you've got a potential here where they are going to be a, possibly a prominent knockout leaving Impact Wrestling in 2021, that being Taya Valkyrie. Now, of course, Ty Valkyrie is scheduled to face Deanna Perazzo for the Knockouts Championship at Hard to Kill in January. But just because she's facing Deanna Perazzo does not mean she signed a new contract. We haven't heard anything about a new contract as of yet when it comes to Ty Valkyrie. I speculated before this could be a deal where it's her final appearance at Hard to Kill. And then once that's done, she's out of the window, she's gone. If you've got a prominent figure leaving the company like that, you have to replace her. You have to replace her. And the Knockouts division is very, very strong. But again, it's strong because of the talent, but also the time that's invested into it. Whether it's TV main events, whether it's uh, pay-per-view main events, TV special main events, you name it. I think Alison Kay, if you are going to potentially lose someone like a Taya Valkyrie, Alison Kay maybe is the perfect person to replace that. Also considering, as I said, the history she has with the company and she's a former Knockouts champion, it just seems like a win-win to me. The likelihood, I think, is difficult on this one, considering that she's already wrestled a match for AEW. Says to me that possibly she would be going there in the future. I don't know. I don't know. It's a difficult one, that one. I think she might be considering that. And I think AEW, when it comes to their women's division, I don't think they're going to change their mentality when it comes to how they book women's wrestling. I think they're just going to throw money and try and bring in more talent, more recognizable talent, and hope that will fix their women's division, when in reality, if they just put time and effort into it and actually had a decent booking philosophy when it came to women's wrestling, it would be totally different. It would be totally different. Let's switch over to a tag team, AOP. Now, AOP is a tag team we did talk about earlier this year. A really surprising release, a really surprising release from WWE this year because at the start of the year, they were working with Seth Rollins. The whole Monday Night Messiah gimmick on Monday Night Raw, they were the backup. Uh, then I believe one of them went down with injury. I don't know if it was Akam or Razor. That was kind of their, the issue, I suppose, with their WWE career is that 
once they got called up to the main roster, all they did was kind of have injuries. They would have stop start pushes. Every time they're on TV, I think they were getting pushed by the company. Raw Tag Team Champions with Drake Maverick, as I mentioned, back up to Seth Rollins and the whole Monday Night Messiah gimmick. They had those promos, didn't they, that lasted for ages, those vignettes where they would speak in their mother tongue and then eventually they started attacking people. I'm a big fan of the AOP. Yes, they were green and I felt they were green in NXT and even when they got called up to the main roster, I still felt they were green. But this is the same tag team that whilst in NXT, whilst being green, they were having fantastic matches with the likes of FTR, uh, DIY, the triple threat tag team match they had. They were a excellent, excellent tag team. And they proved that, look, if they're in there with the right people, they can be guided into having a great match. And they were green at the time. That's why I was so baffled when they were released by WWE. And I think a lot of people backstage within the company were surprised because this was a, this was a tag team that was, again, essentially green, young, but willing to learn, legitimate badasses. I don't know if it's Akam or Razar. I think it might be Akam. No, no, I think it might be Razar actually, is a legitimate MMA badass. He could go sign with Bellator or even the UFC tomorrow. He is a legit badass. So that's my concern, I suppose, when it comes to would they sign with another company, is that Razar, I think it's Razar, could literally go back to UFC or, well, not go back, or go back to MMA rather, tomorrow and be very, very successful in it and do very, very well as a heavyweight. So I wouldn't be surprised if he just goes, you know what, I tried the pro wrestling thing with WWE, it's the biggest company in the world, I tried it, I enjoyed it, they released me, I'm gonna go back to what I know, that's MMA. So I wouldn't be surprised with that. Look, if Impact Wrestling were able to pull this off, it would be a huge signing, a huge signing. And I've said before that I think AEW has the best tag team division in the world. I think it goes without question. Just look at the depth of tag team they have there. The Bucks, Lucha Brothers, uh, big fan of the Acclaimed, by the way. Really big fan of them. I was just watching some clips about them before. Huge fan of them. Dark Order, Best Friends. I mean, you can go on and on, you know, SCU. You can go on and on about how strong their tag team division is. I mean, Blade and Butcher as well. I mean, it's just, it goes on and on. Honestly, it goes on and on. So I could see if they signed anywhere, it would be with AEW. I think AEW, possibly that's what they're missing in terms of a tag team. We've got some really great tag teams in AEW that are high flying, great wrestlers, but do we have that tag team in AEW that is that big, giant, dominant, road warrior-esque tag team? I mean, that's what the AOP were. They were a rip off of the road warriors in NXT, that was obviously what Triple H and the NXT create creative's idea was when it came to AOP. That's why they were paired with Paul Ellering. I don't think Paul Ellering should have ever left them, to be honest. And uh, there was a report that came out prior to the pandemic that there were plans to reunite AOP with Paul Ellering in WWE, but pandemic happened, plans changed, don't we know it this year? So it didn't happen. And then eventually they got released, which again was very, very surprising. But if Impact Wrestling could make that work, if Impact Wrestling could make that offer work, then who knows? I mean, I mentioned that Razor could go back to MMA, but if he works with Impact Wrestling, I mentioned their schedule before here on the channel. They tape TV, what, two, three days a month, if that. They tape them in big, big batches, big bulk TV taping. So just because he would work a couple of TV tapings, he could still focus the majority of his time on his MMA career. And that goes the same with uh, AEW as well. We've seen Jake Hager do it, so it could be the same uh, in AEW. The likelihood of this one... Again, I think the issue here is, the, the main issue here is, is I think AEW will be interested. Now, I think as far as I'm aware, their non-compete clause has expired at this point, so they're available. They just seem, I mean, if you're any major promotion, even if you're New Japan, I'm if New Japan, if, if you know, things open up when it comes to travel and travel is not as difficult and you don't have to do the two-week quarantine, etc., New Japan, I mean, the, this is a tag team tailor-made for New Japan. The the dominant, foreign, ginormous heel tag team, monstrous heel tag team, always has done incredibly well in New Japan. They are tailor-made for that, hard-hitting, strong style. They would be so successful, I mean, so successful in New Japan. So once again, it comes to the uh, the situation as they're gonna, there's going to be a lot of interest in them, and I think there probably is. So impact would have a tough deal i think signing this this tag team but potentially potentially they could do a good brothers here and say impact and say look we know that you'd probably want to work for new japan new japan are interested obviously that's difficult at the moment sign for us if new japan are interested and they want you to work dates you can work that we'll put that into your contract it's the same with gallows and anderson but i suppose it goes to the same aw's done the same for a lot of their contracts whether it's cody kenny omega the bucks Brody lee chris jericho john moxley etc etc They've all that got. They've all got that clause in their contract. So uh, this would be a tough one for them to do. But let's not rule it out. Let's not rule it out. Potentially, we've got a big tag team in the North splitting up. 
Later this year, if Ethan Page, as expected, is not going to re-sign with the company, he's going to be leaving, which means the North splits up. So you've got arguably the biggest and the best tag team in Impact Wrestling about to split up. So you need to replace that. And I think the Good Brothers versus the AOP in a tag team feud over the Impact World Tag Team Championships, that would be money. That would be absolute money. So I would love to see that. So hopefully they can make that one work. What about Eric Rowan? Now, we haven't heard that much from Eric Rowan. I've seen a few interviews that he's done with a variety of outlets. He's going as Eric Redbeard. That's his Instagram and social media handles. Eric Rowan was such a surprising one. And I know I've said this a few times about these releases from WWE. And I know a lot of these names are ex-WWE stars. But in this day and age, everyone at some point has worked for WWE. And I don't think many people would criticize Impact Wrestling. Oh, you're just having WWE cast-offs. Look, these are names that if we didn't have the pandemic, they would still be signed with WWE. People like Eric Rowan, WWE I don't think really wanted to release someone with the the size, the history of Eric Rowan, but the pandemic happened and they made their decision. Eric Rowan for me was up there with the likes of the Good Brothers as the most surprising names when they were released by WWE because I felt he was safe because he was appearing on Monday Night Raw, not all the time around WrestleMania season, but a couple months prior on SmackDown, he's getting the big singles push. He beat Roman Reigns. He beat Roman Reigns in a singles match on pay-per-view in September 2019, Clash of Champions. He pinned Roman Reigns. Yes, he had interference and help from Luke Harper, now Brody Lee, of course, but he beat Roman Reigns. He is the biggest star in WWE right now, the biggest full-time superstar in WWE right now, and he still was in 2019. So this was a guy that's getting a huge push, a huge push. Was the storyline stupid and strange with the whole who attacked Roman Reigns and never really answered, and it was Daniel Bryan and the Eric Rowan doppelganger. Do you remember that? The guy that was also bold with a big ginger beard. How stupid was that storyline? Nevertheless, this was a guy that prior to him getting released he was getting a push then he goes to monday night raw he has the whole cage gimmick which people will, will crap on and i am first to do it there's i think there's videos here on the channel of me saying what a stupid gimmick and what a stupid payoff for a brief period of time that was a good gimmick why because it had people talking and it had interest the issue was and i think a lot of people said this at the time is that you've you've stretched it out so long at this point and people's imagination is running so wild that whatever you reveal it to be, it's going to be a letdown. Now, of course, eventually it was a mechanical spider. See how well that worked? It was awful. It was awful. Now, originally, I think it was going to be a rat, Eric Rowan said, and then they changed their mind that it wasn't going to be a rat. Eric Rowan, I mean, I would go out and watch the interview. I think he said it with Chris Van Vliet. I think it's in his, his interview with Chris Van Vliet. Go and watch it. Excellent interview. He said that once it was getting stretched out so long and he knew that it was going to be an issue, it was knew it was going to be an issue that the payoff was never going to be good enough. He said, you watched American Horror Story. I have to hold my hands up. You can criticize me in the live comments or the comments for this because uh, I've never watched <laughs> American Horror Story. I know, I know, I know. Um, but he said that apparently there's an actress in there that is the world's smallest actress. She is in the Guinness Book of Records for being the world's smallest actress. He said we he pitched to WWE, the creative Let's get her in for a day. She's a, a SAG represented uh, act, uh, actress. Maybe that's why they didn't want to bring her in because she's in a union. But um, they, he said, let's bring her in for a day. We can shoot for her with a couple of hours for the whole day so we can put her into a variety of vignettes and we'll reveal it on TV that actually I've been carrying around this world's smallest actress, this tiny woman inside this cage. Not as I'm keeping her prisoner, not as I'm, I've am i kidnapped or anything like that. I'm trying to protect, protect her from the harm of the outside world. I'm trying to shield her from the mess that the outside world is currently in. And when I heard that, I went, I mean, what an idea that is. I mean, in terms of they stretched it out so long and the payoff was always going to be bad. But when he said that, I went, that is, that is unbelievable. That is incredible. What a payoff that would be. What an idea that would be. How layered is that? How deep is that? There are so multiple ways to think about that. I mean, what a great idea. What an awesome idea. And of course, it didn't happen. Instead, they went for mechanical spider because that's how WWE works. And I just swore, when he said that, I just went, look, that's a too good of an idea for WWE. That's probably why I didn't get over because they went, oh, no, 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 that's too good. That's too good. That's too good an idea to put on TV. Mechanical spider instead. And once he, was that, once he had that gimmick, I mean, any push that he had with Roman Reigns just you know, went up in smoke, really, didn't it? But this is a guy, as I mentioned, was doing very, very well in WWE prior to the whole mechanical spider stuff. Pin Roman Reigns, part of the Wyatt family. We know he can talk. I think he's got a great look. I think he's got an excellent look. 
obviously got size. He can work as well. His ability in the ring for a big man is very, very solid. I know people, when he was part of the Wyatt family, he was probably the member people talked about the least, the original Wyatt family when it comes to Bray Wyatt, uh, Luke Harper, Brody Lee, and Eric Rowan. But you can't uh, ignore his ability to work. Those matches he had with the Shield, the Wyatt family had with the Shield, Elimination Chamber, right, 20... Gosh, when, when was that at this point? 2014? One of the best matches, well, certainly I think one of the best six-man tag matches I've ever seen. I mean, it was just that good. Um, you can't discredit Eric Rowan's uh, part in that because, yes, it had Seth Rollins, Dean Ambrose, uh, Roman Reigns, Bray Wyatt, Brody Lee in there, but it also had Eric Rowan. He still had to pull his weight in there and he did that. So Eric Rowan can absolutely work. And I said before, if Eric Rowan signed with Impact Wrestling, Eric Rowan could be a world champion like that. I mean, literally like that. He could be a world champion. He could come in on the first night and win the world championship, be totally believable as a big heel. I mean, a dominant, can you imagine the big dominant heel, the money they could make with someone like Eric Rowan? I mean, it would be huge. It would be huge. Again, we have to talk about likeliness of this actually happening. It's a tough one. It is a tough one because AEW would be interested. Eric Rowan's just that big a star and he has that amount of potential and appeal. People know him from WWE. I know people have said, well, of course, Brody Lee's in AEW, so Eric Rowan's a given that he's going to go to AEW. I think, if anything, that's the major factor of why he might not go to AEW is because Brody Lee is there. He mentioned this in the interviews that he's done. He goes, look, I'm a, I'm best friends with Brody Lee. I love his work he's doing in AEW. I love that he's being treated as a single star and getting a big push, and he's the leader of this faction in the Dark Order, but I want to let him do his own thing. I don't want us to be paired together forever. Yes, we can come back together in the future, but I want to do my own thing, and I don't want to step on any toes. I don't want to infringe on what Brody Lee's doing. I just, I want to create my own path. And like I said, if anything, the fact that Brody Lee is in AEW, that might be the reason. That might be the reason that Eric Rowan decides, you know what, I'm not going to go there. I'm going to do my own thing in Impact Wrestling. I mentioned about AEW, uh, sorry, AOP in uh, New Japan and how successful they could be. Eric Rowan's the same for me. I mean, this is a guy, if he went to New Japan, pff, forget about it. If we were living in a normal world right now and to travel back and forth would easy, Eric Rowan, I would probably wouldn't even be saying that much about Impact. I would say he'd be in New Japan. Because like the AOP, he is tailor-made for it. I mean, tailor-made for someone like New Japan Pro Wrestling. He would be a huge star. He would be a massive, massive star in New Japan. But obviously, we are living in the world we're living in right now. I think when it comes to 2021, I think we'll hear a lot more from Eric Rowan in the world of pro wrestling. And if I'm Impact Wrestling, I'm looking at him and I'm saying, he is a guy we need to we need to bring in. Because I mentioned before about the top of the card, top of the card missing some... That, that top person, that top person that can carry the company. Eric Rowan's that guy. Not as a baby face, but certainly as a heel, I think he absolutely has that potential. Uh, a couple more names. Uh, one being James Storm. Yes, James Storm. Now, James Storm, he's still technically a free agent. Uh, as far as I'm aware, I don't think he's signed to the NWA right now. Obviously, what a year James Storm has had because he was with the NWA at the start of the year. NWA World Tag Team Champion won half of it. Then there was obviously that report that came out in the summer, but at the time, WWE contacts him, say, we want you to do an appearance at the Royal Rumble. James Storm says, I can't. I'm still under contract with NWA. I'm actually working this weekend. They say, don't worry about it. Specifically, Paul Heyman, who at the time was the executive director of Monday Night Raw. He says, don't worry about it. But what I do want to do is I want to sign you and I want to debut you after WrestleMania. And he goes, fine. Everything's agreed. Contract signed. He's just got to wait to do his physical pandemic happens and like a couple of things on this list everything gets ruined everything gets put on hold and then when it comes to july james storm hasn't heard anything from wwe the deal was off it's fallen through um and what a shame for because this is someone that you know all of these tna guys tna originals eventually have ended up in wwe or getting their opportunity in wwe especially on the main roster and james storm's maybe the exception to that now of course he did have that brief run in nxt and you could argue he should have stuck around at the time he had the decision to stay with NXT, sign a WWE deal, or he had the opportunity to go back to Impact Wrestling at the time. He chose Impact because it was more money. Did it work out for him? Arguably no, because at the moment he's a free agent and potentially he could have been working for WWE right now. Who knows how that would have worked out though. I mean, talk about guys getting ruined from NXT to the main roster. He might he might be a free agent anyway right now. So that was a shame. But then we saw James Storm, of course, return at Bound for Glory. He's part of the Call Your Shot Gauntlet match. He then made another brief return for a match at Turning Point when he teamed with Chris Saban against Triple X Sal. And it was very exciting. We did videos talking about that at the channel. As far as now, we don't know what the situation was with James Storm. I would love to see him have that one last big run in Impact Wrestling, that one last big run where he knocks it out of the park, wins the World Championship. I mentioned it a minute ago when it comes to Eric Rowan. I mentioned it before several times here on the channel. 
what Impact Wrestling is missing out on right now, and it's been very evident, I think, in this crossover with AEW, is that they don't have that one guy at the top of the card. They don't have that premier top, top baby face that you go, that's the guy, that's the, the head of Impact Wrestling, that's the guy that's carrying the company on their back. They don't have the top baby face right now. I think there's people on the roster that could be that. I've mentioned before Chris Bay. I think Chris Bay, give him a year. I think he could absolutely be that guy. I see his money as a top baby face in the company as a world champion. Is he there yet? Well, has he really got the opportunity to be there Be there yet? He had his first world championship match earlier this month for final resolution. I think someone like Chris Bay can get there. But for now, they don't have that person that's right there, the top baby face, that he's the guy, he's the guy that can carry the company. I think James Storm's that guy, even if it's for the next 12 months or something like that. Yes, he's older, but he's probably in the best shape of his life right now. He mentioned that before about getting ready for his WWE run. They got into the best shape of his life. He proved that he can still go. Obviously, the history he has with the company. I mean, he's a TNA original. I think he was on the second ever show or something like that. America's Most Wanted, Beer Money, former world champion, former everything champion. I mean, he's done it all. And I just think that there is more to be told in the history of James Storm and Impact Wrestling. So I hope that after the turning point match he had with Chris Sabin, I hope that's not his last. I hope he comes back. And like I said, I just I, I feel he can be the guy. I feel he can be the guy, even if it's for a short period of time, whilst Impact grooms someone else to become that guy. I feel, I really do feel like he can be the guy. So hopefully uh, James Storm returns in 2021. And finally, Matt Cardona. Now, this one's really interesting for me because Matt Cardona, once he obviously appeared for AEW earlier this year, did a couple of appearances on Dynamite, appeared with Cody. You would have thought, right, he's signing with AEW. He was a name prior to actually signing with AEW that I thought could come to Impact because obviously he was also one of those names released by WWE back in April during the pandemic, during those budget cuts associated with the pandemic. And lots of those, those names did come to Impact Wrestling, whether it was Brian Myers or Heath or the Good Brothers, etc. And I thought Matt Cardona would slot right in there. I thought, if anything, he would probably come in with Brian Myers. Instead, he went to AEW. Of course, he has a huge, long-running friendship with Cody. And once he started making those appearances, I went, that's him done. He's in AEW. That's, you know, that's done. It then comes to pass that he only signed a deal to make like six appearances with AEW. That has expired and we haven't seen him since. We've seen him, but he's very prominent on social media, has his podcast with Brian Myers. And I think at this point, if you're Matt Cardona and if you're Impact Wrestling, you're, you're saying, well, it looks like he's not going to go back to AEW in the immediate future. You've got Brian Myers. You've got other friends, Heath, that he has in the company in Impact Wrestling. I mentioned about James Storm coming in and being that guy. Matt Cardona, he can come and go straight to that level. He just can, and I think that's what his whole career at this point is, is about, is about proving that WWE was wrong. This is a guy back in 2011, the whole Zack Ryder, Long Island IC, Z True Long Island store on YouTube, that was, I mean, so over, so over. One of the top selling merchandises, he had Madison Square Garden enchanting his name, he was one of the most over guys on the roster, and like WWE does, they had to kill it, and they did kill it, and it's not a case of, oh, we were trying to get him over, they weren't, they killed it. How is getting killed by Kane every single week like Kenny from South Park, South Park getting over it? It's not. It's not. They tried to kill it, and that's what they did. Successfully, they killed it. They killed any momentum this guy had, and uh, they did it on purpose. They did it on purpose. There's no, there's no doubt about it. They didn't like it. He got over on his own outside of WWE on YouTube and on social media. They hated it, so they had to kill it. And I felt that coming out of this WWE release, we were going to see Matt Cardona really go, right, they were wrong. I can be a world champion. I can be this. I've got this huge chip on my shoulder. Goes to AEW again, a bit like James Storm, best shape of his career. I thought this is going to be it for him. And he had that tag team match with Cody Rhodes. And I think he appeared at, was the appeal at All Out uh, over the summer. I think that was his last match with AEW. And again, we haven't heard or seen from him since when it comes to pro wrestling television. So I think that the fact you've got Brian Myers in the company right now, I think if you're you're Impact Wrestling, I'd, I'd send some feelers out. Because as I mentioned, Impact Wrestling doesn't have that top baby face. They don't have that guy that's just right up there that can carry the company. Now, is Matt Cardona going to stick around in Impact Wrestling for years and years and years? I don't know. I don't know. But there certainly would be a flexibility there to do what he wants. He would be right at the top of the card. And who knows, maybe he could even feud with Brian Myers. How exciting would that be? Brian Myers feuding with Matt Cardona, they could have some fantastic matches and just shove it in the face of WWE and say, look, this is what you missed out on. And Matt Cardona becoming a, a world champion, I think that happens if he goes to Impact Wrestling. It doesn't happen if he goes to AEW. I don't even know if he becomes TNT champion if he returns at this point. If he goes to Impact, he becomes a world champion. So again, likeliness... Obviously, there's a chance he could go back to AEW. He's got a relationship with uh, with there because he's worked there before. He's got a relationship with Cody. 
I could also see him going to a Ring of Honor as well as something like that. I think as a longtime pro wrestling fan, I think he'd be a bit like EC3 and want to try out all these other companies. But I think potentially, you know, it would be a huge get for Impact Wrestling. And again, I'd be surprised if they don't send out feelers. I really would. Uh, but of course, as always, this is just one man's opinion. What are your thoughts on all of these free agents that Impact Wrestling could potentially sign in 2020, 2021? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. I'll do my best to respond and reply to all of your comments. Really enjoy interacting with you guys, talking about Impact Wrestling, WWE, AEW, all things pro wrestling. Uh, let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Share your opinion and get involved with the community and drop a comment below. If you haven't enjoyed this video, please do smash a like on the like button. Really does help us out here on YouTube. Go up the rankings and get into people's recommendation feeds if they haven't seen our videos previously. Previously. But most importantly, if you haven't already, please do subscribe to Wrestle News 365. You can do that by clicking the bottom right hand corner of the screen right now. Or if you wait a few seconds, there'll be a subscribe button at the end of this video along with another video for you to watch. Thank you very much for watching, listening, streaming, or however you come across this video today. And I'll speak for you again very, very soon. Hey guys, thank you for watching, listening, streaming, or however you come across this video today. Be sure to click on the video on the right there to watch our next video, or click the bottom there to subscribe, or the bottom right-hand corner. Thank you very much, and I'll speak to you again very soon.